going to speak about is another incident from the uh, life of the Prophet And within this incident is another example where we can learn so many lessons. Uh, and this is the incident where Aisha anha was accused of um, being unchaste. And as you know the story, she had been traveling with the Prophet ﷺ in a caravan and she got left behind. And when she got left behind, uh, there was another uh, one of the companions who came and escorted her. When they joined with the rest, some rumors started to be spread about Aisha anha. Now, when this happened and the news of it, you know, it came to the Prophet ﷺ, it came to the family of Aisha anha, and it came to Aisha. And when we look at how everyone responded, there is a lesson for us. Uh, first of all, the family naturally of Aisha anha, you know, it was, it was v under so much stress and there was so much pain to, to, to what the people were saying. Um, and the Prophet Sallallahu himself for one month was in this very, you know, this very stressful situation. And Aisha anha, eventually she ended up in, and went and stayed with her family. Um, and while she was there, and you can imagine, you know, just try to imagine what she was going through. And I think one of the most, you know, if I, if I were to put myself in her place, I think one of the most painful things would have been um, to feel that those around you didn't necessarily believe you. And um, when, you know, she was accused by these people, but, but the problem was that uh, her innocence had not yet been affirmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The revelation hadn't come down yet. So there was still, you know, there wasn't this proof yet that, that it wasn't, that, that she was innocent. And so she had to basically bear with patience not only the accusations by, uh, the, you know, the, the people around her, but she also had to bear with patience the, you know, not that, that there weren't, that even those closest to her didn't immediately, weren't, weren't sure. At the very least, they weren't sure. And so she felt, and you know, there's, there, in the narration, she felt um, this, that, that was very painful to her. That, that she felt that those around her, even her family and so on, weren't, uh, she felt that they didn't believe her or they didn't support uh, and, and, and weren't certain that it was a lie. And, and so one of the most beautiful examples uh, of, of how the Prophet Sallallahu responded comes after, so after a month of this, he goes and he visits her at her family's home. And at this time, again, there had been no uh, revelation regarding the incident. But what I want us to reflect on is his response to such a thing. And, 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 and again, put ourselves in that position. What would we do? Um, what, would, what would we do as a husband or a, as a wife in that situation? And what you'll notice by what he says to Aisha, anha, it's so powerful. Because what he says to her is if you are innocent, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will affirm your innocence. But if it is true, if you have, have done that, then repent to Allah. And Allah, and he reminds her, he tells her that Allah is the most forgiving. Now think about that for a moment. If you are guilty, meaning, meaning what? I mean, he's saying that if this person had been unfaithful to him, so it's, he's part of the equation here, very important, if that were the case. Um, and yet nothing of what he says to her has anything to do with him, has nothing to do with how could you do this to me? If, you, if this is true, how could you do this to me? Isn't that the least that someone would ask their wife? But he doesn't, that's not how he approaches it. He's not looking at the wrong she did to him. His main concern, if it was true, was simply about one thing and one thing only, and that is her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and where she is with Allah. His concern ultimately was for her salvation. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about his ego. It wasn't about his hurt. He wasn't even in the equation. That is so powerful because this is the most painful thing that could happen and one of you know the most insulting if that were true. And yet it was he wasn't in the equation. It was if you're innocent, then it will be proven. And if if you did, 
then repent to Allah. His concern was for her salvation and her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the beautiful character, the mercy that he had. There was no, you know, but he wasn't even trying to make her feel guilty. It was just about repentance if this was true. Shortly thereafter, the revelation came down. And this revelation, I want to you know, just reflect on this for a moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals ayahs 11 to 21 of Surah Al-Nur, proving her innocence, Aisha radiallahu anha. What do I want us to reflect about with regards to that is, you know, a lot of times, and, and you can again imagine the situation that Aisha radiallahu anha was in for a moment, where you almost feel like Everyone's against me. There's these people out here saying these things about me. And then even the people closest to me, she said, you, even, you, even if I were to tell you I didn't do it, you still wouldn't believe me. So even she felt, I mean, you can imagine how she must have felt at that point. And she said to them that I will say the same as what Yusuf's father said, sabrun jameen, I will be patient. So this, it's like this moment, you know, and I think that on some level we can sort of, you know, we inshallah will not be put in this exact situation, but on some level we can understand what it feels like to, you know, feel as though everyone's against you, to feel as though it's, you know, you're on your own. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never left her. And the reason why I think, you know, we, a lot of times when we read the Quran, there's a disconnect, like we feel like, uh, we're listening to the word, we know we're listening to the words of God, but we kind of feel that it's disconnected from my problems. It's disconnected from my concerns, it's disconnected from my life. It's kind of, this is a story about people from before. And, 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 and we don't necessarily understand, we don't necessarily have that connection that this is speaking about my life today, my problems, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't something out there, that Allah is closer than our jugular vein. And Allah hears and knows. Allah tells us that He knows what is in the heavens and the earth and what is between and what is even under the earth. Allah knows everything, what we hide and what we show, what we say loud, what we don't say. Allah knew her situation and Allah had her back. And that's what is so, you know, like, it's so powerful. And there are many, such, many cases in the Qur'an where Allah will send revelation specifically about a situation of, of, of a woman or of a man who, who, you know, maybe that no one else heard or no one else knew, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard and Allah reveals something specifically for her. And he, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he proves her innocence. Now when this happens, we, we need to reflect about the response. Now it has become, you know, it's been proven that this was slander. And now Abu Bakr radiallahu finds out that one of the people who was spreading this rumor was a relative. And not only was this a relative of his, but a relative that he had been supporting financially. Now at this point, uh, Abu Bakr and others who had been supporting this man financially, naturally, say, you know, vow that they will no longer support. To this, Allah reveals another ayah. And in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something very important which we all can apply in our lives. Allah tells, it's, it's, it says in this case, let them forgive, let them pardon and overlook. Do you not love that Allah would forgive you? So this question is being posed to Abu Bakr and to us by extension. Allah is telling us to forgive. Allah is telling us to forgive those people who have wronged us. Allah is telling us to forgive them even when they don't come and apologize. You know, sometimes when we get hurt, someone insults us, somebody harms us, and, we, and, and it's, it's, it's a wrong against us. But sometimes we, we say, well, they didn't even apologize. I mean, even if people apologize, we still hold grudges. 
But sometimes our excuse is they didn't even apologize. They didn't even feel bad. Or their apology wasn't sincere enough. They didn't even feel bad. Look at this situation. Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, this man didn't even, I mean, there wasn't even remorse on his end. It's not an issue of, oh, he didn't apologize well enough. And yet, Allah here is telling him to forgive and overlook. And this is where it's very important because the argument here that Allah makes isn't this man is deserving of forgiveness or this man is this or that. It isn't about the person who harmed you because the transaction when it comes to forgiveness or anything, any transaction between us and the creation is actually a transaction between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why when Allah first, Allah tells him to forgive and overlook, to pardon. After that, it's no longer, see the argument, see Allah tells him to do something, right? Then, and then there's this supporting argument. The supporting argument has nothing to do with the person who harmed him. The supporting argument has everything to do with his relationship with Allah. So when we deal with the creation, we are not dealing with the creation, we are dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are so many texts to this effect that if you, the way in which you deal with the creation is how Allah will deal with you. There, is a, there are a hadith that tell us that those people, for example, who help another person out of a difficulty, Allah will help them out of a difficulty on the Day of Judgment. That when you cover up the faults of another person, you know, the opposite of how, you know, we like to act. When you see someone do something, oh, did you see how she was dressed? Or did you see who she was talking to? And the first thing we want to do is put it on Facebook. Um, we want to advertise it. It's like this, this need, this desire to advertise the faults of others. But when we do that, we should prepare for Allah to do the same to us. Because Allah has told us that He deals with us as we deal with His creation. In, and so Allah tells us the opposite, that when you cover up the faults of your brother or your sister, Allah will cover up your faults in this life and in the hereafter. It's a transaction between you and Allah. And when we see that, when we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the creation, when we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way we act, the way we treat the creation, if we treated people the way we want Allah to treat us in this life and on the Day of Judgment, then we would treat people very differently. This is what you saw coming out of the companions. This is what you saw coming out of Abu Bakr and His response was, yes, I love that Allah would forgive me. Of course he loved. Does anyone in this room not love that? For Allah to forgive us. This is a priceless, priceless gift. And in order to get that, we, we do something that is finite. So what you're doing is, by forgiving the creation something finite, you are in exchange for that getting something infinite, which is the forgiveness of Allah. Isn't that a good deal? It's kind of like, you know, if you go, the best sale in the world, the best clearance, like after Christmas, after Thanksgiving, the best sale. Imagine you see something, it's like a tablet. It's like normally 1,500, 1,000, however much. And then you see it and it's on clearance for a cent. And you bought that, wouldn't you think you got a good deal? You would, right? Because you paid a cent for something that was much worth much more, right? Now here Allah is making a transaction, an offer, Offering a transaction that isn't about a thousand dollars, not worth a thousand or fifteen hundred or fifteen thousand, but this is a transaction that is of infinite value. It is the mercy of Allah. Do you not love that Allah would forgive you? And so Abu Bakr, he not only continued, he forgave this man, he not only continued the financial support, but increased it, gave more. What do we learn from this? We learn how we should respond when we are wronged. Everyone in this room has been wronged at some point or will be wronged. How do we respond? 
Do we love that Allah would forgive us? Moreover, sometimes it is so difficult to forgive other people because we ourselves are not aware of our own need for forgiveness. When a person is veiled from their own faults, it becomes really hard to forgive other people because in our mind, I'm perfect. So because I'm perfect, I can't accept anything less than perfect from others. This is a very, very dangerous deception. Ghurur, it's a deception. Because I think I don't see my own faults, and because I don't see my own faults, I want to hold everyone else accountable for theirs. This is in and of itself a disease. If I were to see how many faults I have, and how many times I have wronged other people, then it wouldn't be so difficult to forgive. It is also somewhat hypocritical for us to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. How many people in this room at some point have asked Allah to forgive you? Hopefully we do this not just one point in our life, but all the time. Allahumma inna ka'afoon tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna, right? We say this. So how can we on the one hand ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and expect that Allah will forgive us when we are not willing to forgive others? It doesn't make sense, right? Especially because the wrong that we do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala far, far outweighs any wrong that anyone could have done to us. We aren't God. The wrong done to me is a human finite wrong. The wrong that we do to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the infinite level because He is infinite and His, what He deserves is infinite and we can never even reach that. We're always wronging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we sin. And yet we are begging Him for our forgiveness. If we want the forgiveness of Allah, this is an easy ticket to it. Forgive other people. This is what we learned from this ayah. The other lesson from this beautiful story is Aisha radiallahu anha, her response to those people who were part of this slander. One example is that one of the companions, Hassan bin Thabit, he was one of the people who was spreading the rumor about her. And others would remind her, because she continued to treat that companion well even though he was one of those who was slandering her. And the people would say to her, but remember, he's the one, he's one of the people who said this about you. And you know what her response was? So powerful. He was also one of the people who defended Islam against the, the kuffar. Why is that so powerful? Because again, like the Prophet them, she took her own ego out of the equation. She took her own self out of the focus. And instead, it, the focus was Islam. The focus was Allah and the message and the deen. So she said what was more important to her is that this was a man who defended Islam and defended the Prophet of Allah subhanahu and defended the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It wasn't about what he did to me. And so she overlooked that and she continued to treat him well. Now there are so many powerful examples from this story. And I think that if there's any lesson you know, that we can take home with us, a few of them are the following. One is treating other people the way that we want Allah to treat us. And realizing that whenever we interact with the creation, that that transaction is actually with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When somebody wrongs you, because this is really an example of, of, of a human being wronging another human being. When someone wrongs you, you can actually use that wrong as a fast track to something infinite. And that is the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you start to see everything in your life in this way as a means to get closer to Allah, whether it's hardship or it's a wrong by another person, if you start to see that, then after a while, you should be sending thank you letters to all those who hurt you. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is Allah has said that by forgiving this person, you can get the forgiveness of God. 
Well, think about it for a moment. In order to, to be able to qualify for this mega clearance, someone has to wrong you first, right? I mean, there has to be first something to forgive. Do you understand where I'm going with that? In order for you to qualify for this clearance, you have to be in a situation where you would need to forgive. In order for you to be in that situation, then it means that someone wronged you. Therefore, start writing the thank you letters. The idea here is that you no longer see in these situations the creation. You no longer see in these situations the pain. You no longer see in these situations my ego, my, you know, my pride, my, I. Instead, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you see your relationship with Him. Just like at every step, that's what they saw. When the Prophet Sallallahu talked about the possibility of it being true, his focus was not, look what you did to me. How could you do this to me? How could you humiliate or, or, or you know, do this public, you know, and have this scandal? His focus was completely her relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These, these amazing people were able to see through the illusions and see Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I'm going to end with, with this example because I think it's something we can all relate to. Uh, and whether or not you have children, at one point you were a child. And you know when you have to take a child to the doctor to get a shot? And these are you know, routine shots. It may be a vaccine or it may be for some sort of cure. Now you see that the response to this shot differs depending on the maturity of the child. The child who's very young doesn't see anything but the needle, doesn't see anything but the pain, and hates the doctor. It doesn't, you, can't, you can't convince the child that this was good for the child. You can't. Try convincing a six-month-old child that actually what just happened was good for him. No, this, was, this is going to make you stronger. It's not really going to work. All that child can see and feel is the pain. All he sees is the needle. When a child gets a little bit older, you know, maybe three, four, five, you can start to reason with the child a little bit. Yes, it's still going to hurt. The child still sees the needle and still feels the pain, but, you know, through clenched teeth can say thank you. <laughs> because in his mind, you know, you've told him, no, this is good for you. This is going to make you stronger. And so you can kind of, it, it's sort of, you know, even though he feels the pain, he can kind of still see the, the wisdom in it. But then when you become an adult, and now you're going for a cure in the form of, in, in, in the form of, a, of a needle or a shot, now you don't even see the needle. You don't even see the pain. And all you, you are actually grateful to the doctor. You're not angry at the doctor. You're thankful. And what does this have to do with our life? Throughout our life, people go through hardships. And our response to the hardship is very much like these different stages of the child, depending on our own ability to see and understand. So our own spiritual maturity dictates how we respond. Many of us respond like the child when we are not at that understanding and all we see in our difficult situations, in our pain, is the pain. We can't see the wisdom, we can't see the cure. And some of us, as we get more mature spiritually and we see that, then we can, you know, have patience at least, even though we still somewhat focusing on the pain. And then there's that higher level where you start to understand that whatever you're going through, it's to heal you, it's to cure you, and it's to make you stronger.